All right, well, hey, tonight is senior night, and that means uh, we do a lot of graduation-themed stuff. And uh, it also happens to be the last night of like our normal school year stuff. Obviously, we got fun stuff coming up this summer. Um, our seniors are lamenting this is their last note pages that they're ever gonna get from us, uh, which is, man, it's, that's crazy. Um, so hey, tonight we got a bit of a graduation-themed message, but I promise this isn't just for the grads. Uh, this is for all of us, so you can take this and apply this. Um, so this, this goes for all of us here in the room. Um, if you got your Bibles, go to Joshua 1. We're going to be there tonight. Otherwise, it is on the note pages, so you can follow along. You know, graduates, uh, you guys get a lot of advice from people at this time of year. You probably have had dad or mom telling you all the things that they think you need to do next. You've got friends suggesting what you ought to be doing and where you ought to be going. You've got guidance counselors and academic advisors uh, trying to help you make it to the finish line without totally fumbling and messing it all up at the last minute. You got people like me, religious leaders, pastors, churches, trying to inspire you and encourage you, speaking to you, trying to say, hey, keep going. Um, graduation is good. Ultimately, though, after all the advice has been given, graduates and honestly everyone else in the room, you got to realize this is your life to live and you have a choice about how you are going to live it. What are you going to do? We can try to tell you about it. We can try to inspire you to live your life well. We can try to challenge you to make a difference, but I can't do it for you. No one can do it for you. You have to make your own choices. And you've got to live with the results. For those of you who are graduating this year, this is a unique time. It's filled with a lot of excitement, maybe some anxiety, maybe a little bit of fear, hopefully not too much. Stepping out into the great unknown, this next chapter always brings these kind of feelings because it forces us to consider the questions that will define our future. Questions like, who has God called me to be at this time in my life? What has God called me to do with my life? And maybe the biggest and sometimes scariest one of them all, do I have what it takes to do what God has called me to do and be who God has called me to be? These are questions about identity and purpose and God's provision. And you know what, for all of us, not just grads, we've got to stop and we've got to ask these questions about our life. Because you know what, we're not always going to have the time to think about these things. We're not always going to have the freedom to pray and dream and consider our answers to these questions. Because you know what, especially for you guys who are, who are graduating, uh, the grown-up world has a lot of demands. Decisions, appointments, sorry, bills, I don't like it either. Um, all these things are going to demand your time and attention. You're going to get caught up in this daily grind, and it really is a grind. Those, you, you know, you guys are students now. You feel the student grind. Wake up, go to school, do your activities, uh, do your homework, go to work, come home, rinse, repeat every day, every day, every day. It's a grind, and adult life is a grind too. And honestly, when we're stuck in the grind, we don't often stop to think about these things. We don't often stop to consider what God is calling us to do. So I want to think a little bit about that tonight. But right now you do have some time. And I hope tonight is, is some of that. You know, just that we can be here, we can be refreshed, we can have some fun, we can stop, we can think. We have the time to think about these questions. Because right now, graduates, you are standing at the boundary of what has been and what's coming next. What you've known so far in the world that is just ahead. And if we look at our Old Testament, I think Israel found themselves at that place. Israel found themselves, you know, in, in the previous what was behind them. They found themselves, you know, in the book of Exodus, enslaved to the Pharaoh of Egypt for 400 years. And they had harsh taskmasters, and they were people telling them what to do, and they had a quota of demands that they had to meet every day. They had no freedom, and they had no power, and they had no voice, and no place, and no authority. And some of you might be thinking, that sounds a lot like school. Kind of is, but I guarantee it was, it was way worse for them. When God finally rescued them from that situation, he sent Moses, and he raised up Moses, and he led the people out of Egypt. But when they got to what was next coming out of Egypt, they didn't always know what to do. They had to start to figure things out, because otherwise they would be clueless. And they had to be responsible for themselves. But God was gracious to them. God was so good to them. He instructed them about who they were going to be, and who they were going to become, and where they would go, and what they would do. And God promised that he would take care of them, that they would make it. 
That they have what it takes if they would just stick close to him and follow his instructions. But if you know your Bible, you know that the people got tripped up. They didn't always make the best decisions. Sometimes they took God's promises and they still tried to do it their own way. They didn't respond well with their newfound freedom. No one watching them, no one telling them what to do. And uh, they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They lost sight of who God had called them to be. They lost sight of what God had called them to do. I think it's similar. Similar thing happens to students who head out into this new adult life. Right? They graduate, they find all this newfound freedom, whether they go to college or stay home or join the military or whatever they do. And they don't know exactly what to do with all of this newfound freedom that they have when they get to make their own schedules and they get to do all these things with no one watching and they get to reprioritize what they want to do. Right? And I, I, see, I see this all the time, right? People who choose to like live life the way they want, stay out all night, make their own choices, waste their money on things that will make them happy, end up wasting their time, um, end up never really doing things that are meaningful, sitting down, doom scrolling their phones all day, just scroll, 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 swipe, 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 until they wake up one day and they realize, what has my life become? How did I get here? How did I end up in this place? And you know what, I, re I realize this is true of I've students I've seen go to college and students I see not go to college. It doesn't really matter. And I don't know about you, but that sounds a little bit like wandering in the wilderness if you ask me. This wandering in the wilderness happens to many of us. We just find ourselves in places where we don't know what to do, we panic a little bit, and then we freak out and do stupid things. For adults, we call that a midlife crisis. Um, but look, hey, um, these questions about identity and purpose and provision, we don't need to put them off. We don't need to just pretend like, hey, that's for someone else, but not for me. This is, this is for all of us tonight. There are important questions that we need to consider. And so when we go back to our illustration of Israel, as they approached the promised land after their time in Exodus, uh, in, in, in Egypt, after their time in the wilderness, they, they come to the promised land, this thing that God had promised to them, and he said it would be so good for you guys. There's going to be room for all of you. It's going to be this land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to enter into this place, and you're going to receive my blessing, and it's going to be so good. And they find themselves on the edge of the promised land, at the boundary line between what was their past and what was their future. There was no question to them about where they were going. They knew they were crossing the river. They knew they were going into the promised land. But there were many questions about what would happen when they got there. Who would they be? What would they do? How would they do it? Do they have what it takes? And so they paused on the banks of the Jordan River. And they listened to their leader, Moses, give the most epic commencement speech of all time. We call it the book of Deuteronomy. It's about 30 chapters long, and Moses outlines, here's what's going to happen next. Here's what you need to remember. And then you know what? Moses passes the baton of leadership to his assistant Joshua, and Moses doesn't go into the promised land with the people. Joshua has to. And now Joshua, who's this younger leader, has to rise up, and he has to lead these people. And you can imagine he's probably overwhelmed. There's expectations, huge weight and pressure placed on his shoulders. He's about to step out into this great unknown, this next chapter. He was probably feeling some excitement. We're so close to getting God's promise. Maybe a little bit of anxiety because remember they sent spies and hey, the people are big and they might be strong and we don't know how we're gonna take their cities. So maybe even a little fear. And it's at that boundary line that God speaks to Joshua. And this is where we find Joshua in chapter one, starting in verse six. Let's follow along. God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then... Will you prosper and succeed in all that you do? This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now I recognize things have changed a lot since the days of Joshua. Heck, things have changed a lot since I graduated high school. I don't even want to say how long ago because it makes me feel old, but I promise I'm not that old. Um, look, even though things have changed, and even though things uh, are going to continue to change, when it comes to crossing over this boundary, God's promises 
have not changed very much. So I think there are some important things that we can learn from God's words here to Joshua. First and most important, remember who God has called you to be. Joshua is the one whom God called to lead the people into the promised land. That's who he was. He was called to be their leader. That's what God said. And that means just like I think like any coach would ever tell you or any leader would ever tell you, people are always going to be quick to criticize you when you're in the lead position. People are going to be quick to second guess your decisions, right? Imagine the people complaining, hey, Joshua, why are we crossing the river here and not there? Hey, Joshua, why did we have to wait so long? Hey, Joshua, why did they get to go first? It's not very fair. Hey, Joshua, why are we going so slow? Hey, Joshua, where are we going to eat? God, 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 Joshua. Everyone has an opinion about everything. And so these words that precede Joshua's call as leader, as we see in verse 6, tell us, be strong and courageous. Joshua has to stand with the strength and the courage in order to remember who God has called him to be, who he's been appointed to be at that time. If he forgets who God has called him to be, he'd probably give up, give in, or settle for something less. Same is true for you and I. If you or I forget who God has called you to be, you'll give up, you'll give in, or you'll settle for something less. God has called each of us to be who he's called us to be, the very best version of who he's called us to be. And remembering that requires strength and courage because there are people, sometimes even friends, sometimes even family members, who offer ideas and plans for you and will encourage you to settle for less than what God has called you to. I think back to my time as a high schooler. My dad worked hard. I remember as a kid, he would take any job possible to provide for our family. Uh, when we lived in Philadelphia, he was a pizza delivery guy. He was a trash truck driver. Uh, he was a student. When we moved to the Chicago suburbs, he was an auto mechanic. He did like septic system repair. He was a union construction worker. He had his own business for a while doing remodeling and construction. He was even a janitor and a maintenance guy at our church. Over the years, he worked in warehouses, driving equipment. He worked for food distribution companies. He even worked at Target. And, and he used to tell me all of that. He had so much experience that he used to tell me, he goes, Rich, this world has nothing to offer you. And it was his way of telling me that the world is going to give me and present me with a lot of things. But none of them were worth it compared to what he thought I could do, the potential he saw in me. He would tell me that, you know what, Rich, I don't care what you do with your life as long as you love and follow Jesus first of all. And my dad, my parents supported me with decisions I made in high school. I graduated high school a year early. People thought I was wasting my time after that when I decided I wanted to serve at my church for a while. When I went to community college, we lived in a really like rich area and people thought I was wasting my time with community college because it wasn't good enough. It wasn't real college. People criticized me when I felt the Lord called me to one school and I only applied to that one school and they said, you are wasting your time and setting yourself up for failure by putting all your eggs in one basket. Why would you do that? Why would I do that? Because I felt like that's what God's call was on my life. And so I want to encourage you with that. Remember who God has called you to be. Love Jesus first and foremost, wherever that direction takes you. As you cross that boundary, you're going to have people pulling you in all sorts of different directions. But like Joshua, you must remember who God has called you to be. The second thing that hasn't changed much since Joshua's time is that you must remember what God has called you to do. In verse 7, God tells Joshua to carefully obey all of the law that Moses gave. He says, don't turn away from it. Don't deviate on it. Don't compromise it. At the heart of remembering who God has called you or what God has called you to do is in verse 8, what the Lord says, keep this book of the law or this book of instruction. This is our scripture. Whatever you do, do not neglect the book. The Bible is full of stories about people like you and I asking the hard questions, seeking God, trying to figure out what is he doing? What does he want? Who does he call us to be? The Bible is our sacred text. I know sometimes we don't always view it as sacred because like we probably got 15 of them on our shelves at home. But the Bible is our sacred text, God's words to us. And it offers wisdom for people like you and I who struggle and strive to live in obedience and right relationship with God. This is the book that God uses according to 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, that tells us all scripture 
is inspired by God and it's useful to teach us what is true, make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. And God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So when we see God tell Joshua in Joshua 1.8 to study this book of instruction, he says, you know what? you got to absorb it. you got to talk about it. You've got to remember, they weren't handing people physical Bibles back then. They were taking God's laws and they were reminding each other by speaking. You've got to talk about God's, God's word. You've got to absorb it. you got to meditate on it day and night, verse 8 says, right? To think about it often. And then you've got to make sure you obey everything written in it. If you're going to remember what God has called you to do and not forget, then you need to read this book. You need to think about it. And you need to apply it to your life. You need to find some friends, find some people who are going to walk alongside you, and you're going to pursue Jesus together under the authority of Scripture. All this talking and thinking about it is aimed at helping you do what it says. Do you see? Talk about it, meditate on it, think about it, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Not just pick the parts we like. We take all of it. Actually doing what the Bible says requires strength and courage because there will be many people who are quick to point out that the Bible is outdated and it's antiquated and it has no role or relevance in our lives today. And what do we do with that? Sadly, many Christians over time begin to adopt that idea themselves, that God's word just doesn't matter in our modern culture. It doesn't have enough to speak into what you and I go through in our contemporary society. My hope and my prayer is that this does not happen to you graduates, this does not happen to you students. It takes strength and courage to say that if things like holiness and love and grace and truth are outdated and irrelevant today, that that's not a problem with our scripture, that's a problem with our culture. So if you're gonna remember what God has called you to do, you have to get into the Bible and allow it into your life. The third and last thing I want to suggest to you that has not changed since Joshua's time is that you have to remember you have what it takes. And this is not some self-help you can do it, rah, rah, let's go. Joshua had what he needed to be who God called him to be and to do what God called him to do because he was not setting out on his journey alone. He had God with him. And he had the people of God on his side. Verse 9 tells us, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever. Say that again, wherever. No, no, you guys aren't getting it. Say it, wherever. wherever. No, no, like you believe it. Wherever. No, 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 one more time. Wherever. wherever. Do you actually believe that, that God is with you wherever you go? Yes. Do you know it? Yes. You need to know it. You need to believe it. You need to experience it. And I want you to know today that you never have to feel like you need to go through it alone because God is with you and the people of this church are with you. You never need to doubt that you have what it takes because God is on your side. He will never abandon you or forsake you. That's going to be tested in your time. Whether you're a student or a graduate, it doesn't matter. That will be tested. And you will wonder, is God with me? Has he left me? Has he forgotten he is with you wherever you go. So when you cross this boundary line into the future that God has for you, there will be times where you feel like giving up. There will be times where you do not know what to do. There will be times where you hit the breaking point and you don't think you have anything left to go another step. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. God's words to Joshua are God's words to us today. Be strong and very courageous. Remember who God has called you to be. Remember what God has called you to do. Remember, you have what it takes because the Lord is on your side. What did verse 8 tell us? And you'll be successful. You'll prosper and succeed in all that you do. I'd like to pray, and then I've got a few more things we're going to do tonight before we go to small groups. So would you pray with me? God, we need these reminders from your word. All of us need these reminders from your word. That when we go through today and every day, God, we were be reminded of who we are because of who we are in you. That we be reminded what we're called to do because you laid out good works for us and you call us to be disciples who make disciples. 
that we'd be reminded that we do not go through this faith journey alone. We have you and we have your people alongside to encourage us, to support us, to challenge us, to call us out when we're wrong, and to restore us. Father, we need these reminders. For every student here, God, I pray that that would be real in their lives. For every person, me included, that it would be real in my life. Father, and I pray that especially for our graduates as they head into the next few weeks and everything is 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 crazy and chaotic with celebrations and parties and, and, and ceremonies. God, that they would not lose sight of these things. And as they head into whatever chapter you have next for them, Father, that they will walk with confidence in you knowing who they are, what they're called to do, and knowing that you will never leave them or forsake them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.